Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. You shall not make for yourself any idol. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not be a false witness. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of this world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of Scripture. A reading. Now, a reading from the prophet Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them, and there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord." So I prophesied as I had been commanded, 
And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let us read responsively by half verse, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have called you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. If you, Lord, were to note what is done amiss, for there is forgiveness with you, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for Him. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord. With Him there is plenteous redemption. reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. After having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. Let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. <clears throat> and when he, she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews, were where the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you would always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, 
his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Well, it's not your imagination. We have been getting some really long gospel readings the last three weeks. John has, been, we were talking about it earlier. BJ said that maybe that's part of our Lenten practice. Really long readings of the gospel. Um, so thank you, Reverend Tom, for being here to read that for us. Um, so I want to start off with an example that uh, is just sort of for our imaginations. But... Uh, I think it, it sort of takes us uh, to a place where we can start thinking about today's readings uh, in a way that uh, might make some sense to us. So let's say, for argument's sake, uh, the Episcopal Church was doing its national convention in Florida, okay, in Florida, and we decided to send a delegation to go. So we go down to Florida, and we go to a big convention center where we're all going to meet, and, uh, you know, it's got lots of people there. It's a large cavernous space, and um, I don't know about you all, but uh, as I've gotten a little bit older, um, I can still hear okay, but I don't hear quite as well as I used to. And whenever I'm in a crowded environment where there's lots of people talking, I can sometimes misunderstand words. And so uh, what I hear is probably not what the person said. So I was thinking about this example, and let's say again we were in this big, big space at this convention center. Maybe we're trying to look at it for a way to get up to the second floor. And somebody says, hey, look over there, there's an escalator. My hearing, where I'm at today in life, might tell me that what I heard was, hey, there's an alligator, <laughs> right? Not the same thing at all. Not the same thing. So not an escalator, but an alligator. And of course, since we're in Florida, you might think for a second, wow, is there really an alligator here? But, uh, but of course, I would, you know, immediately think to myself, well, I must have misheard that. But just in one other sort of imaginative step in this example, let's say that the side of the escalator was actually painted. And because we're in Florida, let's say it was painted with an image of an alligator. Now we're kind of in this realm where we're really kind of confused about exactly what that statement might mean. So did the person say, hey, there's an escalator? If maybe they would have really said, hey, there's an alligator and meant the, like both things at the same time. So it's an escalator. So that's the physical thing. It's got a painting of an alligator, so there's a figurative thing, and it's possible for both of those things to be true simultaneously. It can actually be both. And the physical thing could be pointing us to the figurative thing. Now, if you're already, if your head's spinning a little bit with that explanation, now you know what it's like to listen to John, <laughs> right? Listening to John and listening to some of his stories can kind of make you feel a little bit like that, because... There are lots of examples where he takes the physical reality of something and uses it to point to a, a, some other kind of reality, some kind of spiritual truth. And we really have to like, spend some time with him in order to figure out exactly what he's talking about or where he's going with things. And this happens several times in our story today about the raising of Lazarus. So just as a place to start, just as an example, 
As we get through like just the first part of the reading, we hear that Jesus is going to head back to Judea. He's going to return to Judea. He knows that Lazarus is sick. He, a messenger has come to him and the disciples, and they know that they need to go back. And so he says, let's go back again. And the disciples say to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you're going to go back again. So the question is pretty clear cut. Do you want to go back to a place where people might actually hurt us? You know, that seems like a pretty straightforward question. Do we want to go someplace where our lives might be in danger? And what's Jesus' answer? Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. That does not sound like a straightforward answer, right? I'm, I'm, I'm afraid for my health. I'm afraid for my, my bodily safety. Okay, are there not 12 hours of daylight? The, the answer doesn't seem to fit the question. And John delights in doing stuff like that. But if we think about it a little bit, and if we know that Jesus has already been identified as the light of the world, then the answer starts to make a little bit more sense. His point is that the journey may be dangerous. The, the journey may actually put them in, in, uh, in some risk. There may be some risk associated with it. But because they're going to be following Jesus, who is the light, they should be able to put their anxiety and their concerns aside. Jesus is basically saying, you're going to be following me. It's going to be okay. I am the light, and you're going to be following and walking in the daylight. And if you go a different direction, if you take a different journey, then it will be like stumbling in the darkness. Now, the journey, as it turns out, is obviously for the sake of Lazarus. He's going to go do something for Lazarus. But it's also for the sake of others as well. So a little bit later on, Jesus says to his disciples, for your sake, I am glad I was not there. In other words, for your sake, I'm glad that we're going to take the journey now. So there's going to be something for the disciples that's going to happen as well. There's going to be something to their benefit that occurs at the end of the journey. And Thomas responds to this and he says, well, then let us go that we may die with him, that we may die with Lazarus. Now, again, we've just been told that this journey is going to be to their benefit, but their deaths don't sound like a benefit, do they? Like, how is that going to be beneficial to them? So, as it turns out, this whole question of death and life and what Jesus is going to be doing for Lazarus isn't just going to be confined just to Lazarus. There's going to be other people that are going to be touched by what's going to happen. It's going to involve the disciples. It's going to involve Martha. It's going to involve Mary. And it's going to involve the crowd that is consoling them after Lazarus dies. So whatever Jesus is going to be doing, he's going to be doing it for everyone. Now, when he arrives, he meets Martha. Martha comes out to greet him. And she has a very strong personality. Some of you all may have Maybe, maybe familiar with, remember other passages of scripture involving Martha and Mary. But Martha has a very forthright personality. She's very honest. And she's not afraid to tell Jesus what she thinks. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So she is not afraid to hold him to account. And now we're getting to the heart of what this whole passage is about. Now we're getting to the heart of what John is trying to communicate to us about Jesus. And about his effect on everyone. So a little bit later, Jesus tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And her response is, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And now we're getting to the real point of the story. Lazarus has died, but Lazarus is going to live again. But there's something about what Jesus is doing that's going to affect every person. And every person who confesses a faith in Jesus will in some way also experience some kind of a death. And at the end of that, something new will emerge. And so now, earlier on, when we heard Thomas say, let us also go that we may die with him, we start to get a feel for what he meant by that we start to understand what he might have been saying. 
Now, when the moment finally comes, it's very dramatic. And again, we're very much now dealing at the level of actual physical occurrences. When the moment finally comes to bring Lazarus forth, Jesus offers a prayer. Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here. For the sake of the crowd standing here. And when Jesus cries, Lazarus, come out, he does come out. But he is wrapped up. Now, we all are probably familiar with certain um, examples from the natural world. For instance, a caterpillar. Caterpillar goes, spins a cocoon, and then after a certain amount of time, goes through a metamorphosis, and then emerges as a butterfly. It's the same being, right? The caterpillar and the butterfly are the same being, but the thing that emerges from the cocoon is not the same as what went into the cocoon. And Lazarus is literally wrapped up in bandages. He's literally wrapped up in bandages. And Jesus says to unwrap him. And so there's this idea that as Lazarus is unwrapped, as he emerges back into the world, he's not exactly the same thing that he was. That what went into the tomb and what came out of the tomb are not exactly the same. That which is unwrapped has been brought back through Jesus. And that effect has transformed him. So at the very end of our reading, we hear many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what Jesus did, believed in him. So they were changed as well. So Lazarus becomes this physical example of new life being offered. But it's new life that's also being offered to Martha and to Mary and to the disciples and to the crowd and it's also being offered to us. In fact, one way we could think about today's reading is for us to think of ourselves as the crowd. We're the crowd witnessing Lazarus emerging from the tomb alive and seeing him being unwrapped as something new. And so I think that's really what John's point is today and giving us this story about Lazarus coming back to life. In fact, it's really the whole point of John's gospel. Jesus is life. Jesus is life. And so Jesus stands opposed to and as a way for us to think about the solution for death. When Jesus is disturbed in spirit, we hear that in our reading today. It's at the time when everyone is weeping. Everyone is full of, of despair over the loss of Lazarus' life. And it could be that the reason why Jesus is so disturbed is because he's angry at the power of death to overcome us. He's angry at the power it has over us to cause us to fall into grief and despair that wraps us up like a mummy and keeps us trapped in the tomb. And Jesus is having no part of that. He's having no part of that at all. It's not that we shouldn't grieve the loss of those that we love. That's just part of the human experience. That's just part of our lives. We're always going to grieve the losses of those that we care about. But for Jesus and for those who choose to follow Jesus, there's also another thing that we know about. And that is that there is always new life for all of us. And it's not just new life for us in the world to come, but it's new life for us here, right here and right now. We're all going to experience loss, we're all going to experience illness, and we're all going to experience death at some point. But it never has the final say. It never has the final say. Now, this Sunday is the last Sunday. Uh, it's the final Sunday of Lent. At least it's the final Sunday where we, we call it, you know, this, a Sunday of Lent. Next week, we're going to start with Holy Week, believe it or not. It's already here. So as we sort of think about the message on this last Sunday of Lent, we can reflect on the ways that perhaps we allow ourselves to live sometimes outside of the kind of hope that's being offered us. The way we sometimes forget that hope. And maybe we weep and grieve over our losses 
And we only feel the death of things instead of remembering that there's always new life there as well. And when we find ourselves in that place, because often we do, we can remember that Jesus is deeply moved by that. Jesus knows that we feel that way sometimes. And that disturbs him in spirit. And that's why he wants to show us an example in Lazarus of new life. So again, like I mentioned, next Sunday is going to be the beginning of Holy Week. We'll be doing Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday will be the beginning of our journey, as it is every year, where we travel with Jesus as he confronts his own death and as he confronts the threat of of despair. And yet, here's the thing. Just as Lazarus emerged from the tomb, so too will Jesus emerge from what he will experience during his journey in Holy Week. And perhaps what today's reading is really telling us is just a reminder again that the tomb is never the end of the story, that it's only the beginning, and what comes after that is always Easter. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world, especially St. Paul's Cathedral, Holy Trinity Cathedral, Montevideo, Uruguay, the Diocese of Central Florida, the Diocese of the Central Gulf Coast, and the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem and the Middle East. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Paulson, our bishop, Chris and Tom, our clergy, Alex and Audrey, our wardens, vestry, delegates, all who minister in Christ, and for all the holy people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, especially our leaders, Joe, our president, Kamala, our vice president, Josh, our congressman, James and Mark Wayne, our senators, Kevin, our governor, and Marlon, our mayor that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours, especially 
Melody, John, Jason, Gabby, Phoebe, Trapper, Brenda, and Blake. And grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Holly and family, the Johnson family, Ronnie, Julio, Nico, Mike, Steve, John, Nancy, Betty, Crystal, Melanie, Geneva, Fred, Glenn, Brittany, Rose, Karen, those impacted by war, especially in Ukraine, all emergency responders, United States military, and those whose suffering is known only to God. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom, and especially, Lord, those injured in the, pre in the storms. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another in the name of the Lord. We had about uh, 22 scouts and scouters on the Azalea cleanup yesterday. They did a great job. We dragged all kinds of stuff up out of the ditches and did it. It looks wonderful where we were. Uh, coffee hour today. Uh, John and Sharon have gone all out. Please come enjoy. It's going to be delicious. And don't forget there are lilies to sign up for.
Of course, I have another fish on Friday announcement. <laughs> Um, the tuna casserole was really good. It was wonderful. We got a lot of compliments. We didn't have as many people as we have been having, but we blamed it on the rain and the fact that there was another community organization uh, close to us having a luncheon fundraiser. And we had to admit there's a lot of people who don't like tuna. Um, we had about 25 people. We usually have about 30, 35. So there were about 10 less, but even so, the strangest thing happened. We made exactly the same amount of money that we've been making every Friday. So how do you suppose that happened? Next week is the last Friday in Lent and our last fish on Friday. We're gonna have fish tacos with spicy coleslaw, Mexican rice. Did you know there's a difference between Mexican rice and Spanish rice? I had no idea and sopapilla cake. So thank you once again to the Fish on Friday helpers and to the Fish on Friday diners and to those of you who brought friends. And as you're well aware, this money goes to help develop our corner at 6th and Broadway. And yes, Cedric, we will save you a go box. <laughs> save well, it's nice to know that threats work <laughs> we got several pledge cards in this week. Thank you all very much. <laughs> uh, if you have not turned one in, just remember there's some blank ones in the back. I forget to tell you. So people were asking me for one. I said, well, they're in the church. So anyway, I'm not going to call you yet, but I still got a few people I need to work on. But some of you are just kind of lazy, and some of you figured out they gave me a pledge card last year, and they thought that was giving me one this year. Well, that's not. But anyway, if we're doing well. Uh, I'll give you a better report once we get them all in. But uh, the pledges I've seen, three-fourths of the people at least have raised their pledges. So I'm real pleased with that, and I want to thank you all very much. Okay, well, good morning again. So as we've been talking about, we are concluding our journey through Lent for this. Uh, technically, the reason why I kind of uh, hesitate to say that a little bit is because, um, strictly speaking, Lent go takes us all the way to Easter. So Holy Week and Lent are kind of happening at the same time. But really, when we uh, do Palm Sunday, when we do our Palm Sunday service next Sunday, we are very much in Holy Week mode at that point. And so all of our Lenten messaging and all of our thinking about Lent and all of our ways that we try to um, sort of reflect during Lent, that all kind of like concludes, you know, we're going to do fish on Friday and we'll have our last fish on Friday event uh, for Lent uh, this upcoming week. And then uh, next Sunday is going to be Palm Sunday. So that's a really wonderful service. We'll actually start outside, weather permitting, and we will do a, uh, a palm procession around the church. That'll bring us into here for worship. And then that kicks off all of the Holy Week activities. Easter is in two weeks. Easter is in two weeks, believe it or not. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, Palm Sunday, um, at 10, the service will start at 1030 outside, and then we'll have a Monday Thursday service. We'll have um, Stations of the Cross on Friday at 6 o'clock, followed by our Good Friday service at 630, and then we will have our Easter services at 1030, and, um, and that'll, be, that'll be the big celebration of the year. That's sort of the thing that the church... Uh, uh, you know, moves towards all year long. Like our entire liturgical calendar, it's all taking us right to Easter. So two weeks, it'll be here. Um, we'll have our final uh, Lenten book club meeting on Wednesday. We'll conclude the book that we've been reading, Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry Nowen. That will be at seven o'clock. Um, and uh, what else? What other... We'll have a vestry meeting, yeah, for members of the vestry. We'll be meeting um, on Monday, so tomorrow, tomorrow evening, uh, for that at 5.30. So vestry meeting at 5.30. Uh, all right, so any um, birthdays or anniversaries this week? Okay. Ah, behind you. Wow. And he came from behind. It's actually my birthday. <laughs> Today? No, Thursday. Oh, Thursday is? Okay, nice. All right, so we are going to pray for Van and for anybody who may be watching who has a birthday or anniversary this week as well. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace 
and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Happy birthday. And if you all want to send him a birthday message, it will be on Thursday. His birthday will be Thursday. But do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. All things come from thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people. In your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ. And bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Look with compassion, O Lord, upon this your people, that, rightly observing this holy season, they may learn to know you more fully and to serve you with a more perfect will. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. to love and serve the Lord.